Okay, well, the next is the taxonomy. This is a general overview of taxonomy of have blooms, so we're going to look at all of them, including cyanobacteria, and then we'll come back after lunch and look specifically at the ones that I want you to focus on. Okay? So I want to kind of cover the, in general, all of the harmful algal bloom groups, and then how we're going to approach cyanobacteria identification, and then come back to it after lunch even more specifically. So I'm kind of giving, it, giving this to you twice. Okay, our back to, maybe I didn't say this already, but I think everyone understands what a water bloom is. Um, proliferation of single-celled filamentous colonial microalgae and even seaweeds. So uh, the, uh, the macrocystis and the things that you harvest off the coast of California would even be could qualify as an algal bloom or a water bloom, even though they're macrophytes and they're all up in the water column. But in the more classic sense where we're dealing with cyanobacteria, really, and red tides, it's more a proliferation occurs when nutrients, temperature, pH, and light are conducive to good growth and may be favorable at physical factors like slow motion, you know, slow, high retention times in the water supply, slow flushing times. But only a few of the many phytoplankton species, about 40 in the cyanobacteria. There are about 1,500 species of cyanobacteria. Only four of, about 40 of them have been identified or confirmed as producing toxins. The problem is that those 40 include the ones that are responding best to changes in the nutrient profiles and the morphometry and morphology of lakes and reservoirs and everything. So, and that goes with all the others too, the red tide toxins. Most of them don't produce toxins. But again, the ones that seem to be responding to development and perturbations are the ones that produce the toxins. So proliferation of non-toxic species can also be harmful in the sense they decompose and, and uh, deplete oxygen and stress fish and other things. Um, but all states in the U.S. countries worldwide are affected. The blooms cause water discoloration, hence we get these terms red tides, brown tides, blue-green blooms, so on and so forth. In the uh, botanical world, there are divisions in the zooplankton world and animal world, there are phyla, but there are about eight divisions of the algae, and um, only a certain ones of these can produce toxins. So, the cyano, pro they used to be called cyanophyta, or cy so blue-green algae started out as blue-green algae, then they were called cyanobacteria, and the group title heading, the, the big division level heading was called cyanophyta. The new terminology is cyanoprokaryonta, and we'll talk more about that after lunch. That's the cyanobacteria. The green algae, the chlorophyta, none of those are toxic or toxin producers. The division caryophyta, the stoneworts, like cara that you get growing in these little brackish ponds, I'm sure you have them. Those are algae, but there's nothing toxic about them. The division Chrysophyta, which things like golden algae and yellow-green algae, this has the diatoms, and there are some marine diatoms that are toxin producers. In fact, that's your issue out here off the coast right now. The uh, pyrophyta, the dinoflagellates, again, that would be a significant toxic group, but again, marine. So this is these two are marine, and this is freshwater, brackish water, some marine. And then the rest of them aren't an issue for toxicity. So the euglenids, the brown algae, and the red algae, your, your big macrophytic marine algae, none of those produce any sort of harmful toxins, even though they may have ver various uses, um, you know, stabilizers, the green algae, the laminaria, and the algins. So that's the groupings in general of the algae. So what I'm going to do is go through the toxic groups, and most of those are going to be in the dinoflagellates, the marine. And then, so we'll have three. So three of these divisions contain toxic members. 
while all algae in general are an integral part of the food chain, hence the toxic ones cause problems for the food chain. So we have what we call the primary producers, the plants and the algae, the primary consumers, the zooplankton, the suspension feeders, secondary consumers, um, they can be both planktonic and benthic, and the tertiary consumers like, <clears throat> like us. And then this is a little cartoon just showing you all those things. So you can start to see, as you've already asked me, what about biomagnification, what about food chain? Well, clearly in the marine environment, those food chain effects are significant. They are the most significant route of exposure because blooms being so big and dispersed, we don't drink seawater. And so, and, uh, so very seldom do we recreate in a significant red tide. So that becomes the most significant route of exposure is through the food chain for the marine harmful algae. Not so much for the freshwater. I've already shown you this same slide. So again, those dinoflagellates comprise at least three, four, five of the groupings of toxic. So each one of these represents a distinct taxonomic grouping and a distinct chemical toxin grouping. And it, we're, again, we're not going to get into the toxins, but this would be your, you know, your paralytic shellfish poison and your saxitoxins. Uh, you know, <coughs> the neurotoxic shellfish poisons are the gymnodiniums and the brevitoxins. The one down here, domoic acid, is the one that you have the issue with out off the coast. And it causes, and you can tell from these, okay, this is paralytic, this one is diuretic, this is neurotoxic, this vectors through the fish, these three vector primarily through shellfish, this vectors primarily through shellfish. So those, those syndromes were designed to kind of give you an idea of what, what it was that was happening. So let's look at the dinoflagellates first. Those dinoflagellates are diverse unicellular, sometimes filamentous, but mostly unicellular, um, mostly marine, some freshwater. We're getting some inkling that some of the freshwater uh, the dinoflagellates may have some toxic factor, but it's not a significant issue yet. They are obligate to facultative photosynthesis. Dinoflagellates kind of occupy a mid-range between plants and animals. So they're uh, always kind of tossed back and forth. Some produce these very spectacular bioluminescent events, which you can get off the coast here. Some are even parasitic because, again, they weren't all photosynthetic. And so you can kind of get some that are, are even parasites. Uh, but the main thing we're referring to is that they form these blooms, making the water golden brown, brown or red, or the so-called red tides. Humans eat the contaminated fish and shellfish and give you syndromes such as the PSPs and the DSPs. An interesting um, new molecular event or biochemical event, it's very likely that the dinoflagellates assumed symbiotically the ability to photosynthesize. They got that photosynthetic apparatus from cyanobacteria, however long ago they evolved. Hence, when I talk about uh, you know, the primary toxin out of red tides being the saxitoxins, and now we know that cyanobacteria produce it, it's very likely that dinoflagellates acquired the ability to produce the red tide saxitoxins from cyanobacteria. Another trivia point, which I think is interesting. Paralytic shellfish, or PSP, actually started out here in California. Uh, Native Americans hundreds of years ago recognized that there were certain times of the year when you didn't collect shellfish. And um, that recognition, of course, was eventually picked up by everybody else and uh, led to the first investigations of what might be happening. And there was a fellow named Ed Shantz who worked at Caltech and he did the first PSP identification and biochemistry for the saxitoxins in the 1950s. 
and um, that turned out to be the very first algal toxin or phycotoxin to be structurally identified. So the primary one from paralytic shellfish toxin are the saxitoxins. The symptoms are neurological primarily. They can be life-threatening. Again, it's all dose-dependent, but it's fairly easy to get a single butter clam, for example. It'll have the equivalent of half a dozen people doses in it for lethality. You don't have to eat the whole one. You could eat just a part of one and it'd be lethal. So those key symptoms are tingling of the mouth and numbness. That's the first thing is that your, your fingers get numb and your mouth gets tingly and then it progresses to the face and the neck and your neck becomes stiff and your muscles become stiff. Then you get drowsiness, figure rash, headache, nausea. Uh, and of course, ultimately, if it's a lethal, then respiratory arrest or paralysis. And if that person can be gotten to a facility with a respirator, and you're put on a respirator, usually within 24 hours, you get up and you walk away. Um, so it, it does, you know, it, but if you don't, then obviously you're not gonna get up and walk away. So there are supportive treatments. There is no antidote for any of these toxins, regardless, including the cyanobacteria toxins. But there are, in certain cases, supportive treatments. Uh, the, uh, the main dinoflagellate, goniolax, protogoniolax, alexandrium, whatever you call it, looks like this. The, the dinoflagellates are called the armored algae because very often, especially the ones that produce toxins, have a an armored plate around them called fecal plates. And you can see these are individual plates, like if you were a, uh, an armored knight and you had all those different plates of metal around you so that you could move these different plates. And those are important because that's how you do the identification. The numbering and positioning and location and shape of those plates is how you determine at the species level these organisms. They're also motile, so this sulcus or this groove uh, that goes around the cell and then down the cell has the flagella that allows them to be motile. Diuretic shellfish poisoning, or DSP, again is another group of dinoflagellates distributed worldwide, so we have, it's more of an issue in other places than the U.S., although if in the Caribbean it can be an issue, but it's not so much an issue around here. A genus called Dinophysius, and the toxin they produce is called Okadiac acid. And interestingly, Okadiac acid has the same mechanism of action toxicologically as microcystin, but can't confuse them because this would be marine and microcystin would be freshwater. But that's an interesting other thing. Symptoms are largely, as the name implies, diuretic. So it's gastrointestinal. Uh, very few, I don't think, I guess, any fatal cases have been reported, but you may wish you were dead, I guess. Diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Um, I've known people that have had diuretic shellfish poisoning. Again, it'll clear up in a few days. But it's usually from buying contaminated shellfish in the market. So again, there's no antidote. You simply support a treatment for diarrhea. <clears throat> Dinophysius looks like this, so slightly different shaped, but you can see the pores in the uh, plates, and this would have had the flagella through here and trailing for motility. So that's your diuretic. Neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, or NSP, is probably next to the PSPs the most significant in terms of health risk. And not so much even health risk for people, but um, fish and big mammals. This is the toxin that gives you grief for manatees and seals, especially in the Florida and the Gulf and the Atlantic areas. Reported on the Gulf of uh, Mexico, east coast of Florida, and now in, in Europe as well in later years. 
ingestion of contaminated shellfish, symptoms milder than PSP, similar to ciguatera in the sense that it's more of a gastrointestinal. Uh, so it leads to massive fish mortalities is where it usually shows up most often. And they are also an issue in uh, aerosolation. So in Florida, maybe here in, I don't think in California, but in Florida they post um, uh, respiratory things. People wear masks and they're at the beach swimming. Uh, it affects lifeguard people that are working in it. So at, at times when the bloom is close in and the aerosol spray comes in, uh, they actually have monitoring stations that um, air sampling that collects and tests right on site to sort of post when it's an issue on the coast. Um, no, in, in the aerosolation situation, it's more of a uh, tearing and a respiratory distress, so difficulty breathing. Uh, ingestion would be the one that's the more gastrointestinal. The causative organism, again, is a dinoflagellate, and it used to be called gymnodinium, but it's now called Karenia because the taxonomy was all sorted out in the 1990s, particularly, uh, by a woman at, uh, named Karen Steidiger, who's just retired this last year. And so they renamed this whole group Karenia. The toxins produced are called brevitoxins. They're largely gastrointestinal, but depending upon the dosage, it can be neurological. And you get a respiratory irritation from aerosol toxins. Treatment is basically get away, get away from it. Uh, filter masks or air conditioned environments. Uh, sometimes people literally have to close up their houses near the beach and uh, use uh, air conditioning. Uh, here's a Karenia brevis bloom. See the reddish brown to the water, and these are all dead fish floating all over. So that's often the key to this one. Although uh, the other keys would be manatees that are beached and washed up and in distress, uh, dolphins as well. NSP, the neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, um, Again, Karenia looks like this. Again, it's a dinoflagellate. Here's the groove. In fact, you can see the flagella in this one. This is the other flagella groove. But again, all of these I showed you, remember, are unicellular and motile. Ciguatera, fish poisoning. Again, the implication here is that the vectoring is through fish, and this is in the case is, is uh, reef fish primarily. This is the most common reported marine toxin poisoning. Probably some 50,000 cases a year, and that's a rough one, but affects all areas, especially Pacific Caribbean areas, more tropical than temperate. Um, <clears throat> associated with consumption of the contaminated shellfish, or contaminated reef fish. These tend to grow attached more and less so as a bloom. So they're on the reef, especially reefs that get disturbed by storm or development activity. And then they colonize and grow, and then the fish feed on it and concentrate the toxin and people eat it. So this is the one that in many areas of the Indi you know, West Indies, Virgin Islands, et cetera, uh, South Pacific, there's, you know, you have an island and they can't collect any of the fish, so they eat canned tuna fish. <laughs> you know, none of the fish are safe to eat, and it often is that way all the time. Quick question. Mm. Does that only affect fish or shellfish or? Well, well, fish, anything that feeds on that reef that's containing the, the algae, yeah. So it's usually fish, because uh, shellfish would be filter feeders, so that the algae would have to be suspended in filter feeding. It can be but most often that I've ever seen it's all fish that are the vectors. <coughs> but it doesn't actually uh, kill fish? No, yeah. no. Again, like saxitoxin doesn't kill shellfish. They just concentrate it. Um, 
the main one is called gamber discus, but there are others that also produce it. The toxin is primarily called ciguatoxin. Again, symptoms can be neurological, but primarily gastrointestinal. Uh, so you get diarrhea, pain, nausea, muscular pain. I, and I've actually known people that have had this symptom as well. Again, no lethal cases, but again, you get very, very sick. And one of the strange things is you'll get this reversal of hot and cold, so that hot water feels cold and cold water feels hot. And that sim those symptoms can last for months. This toxin slowly disperses out of the body. There are some prophylactic treatments, like I don't know how these work, but vitamins, antihistamines, anticholinesterases uh, apparently give you some relief from them. Almost any kind of reef fish can be a vector for the toxin in the affected areas. Um, you know, so the more, more popular ones that you eat would be the ones most at risk. Snappers and groupers and uh, things like that. The ones that they isolated the toxin from are the eels, because eels are the biggest. So eels would live the longest. They would concentrate the highest levels. When I was, I uh, did a sabbatical in Hawaii, and they were collecting specimens to isolate and purify the toxin back then. This was in the 90s. And uh, they had a freezer, and they opened up the freezer, and it was like cordwood. There were like 50 eels, each about four or five feet long, just stacked in here. And as you can imagine, you'd have to, to extract enough toxin for chemical identification. Uh, you had to extract hundreds of pounds of, of flesh, which was very tedious. Okay, and that's what gamber discus looks like. Again, you see the fecal plates grew for the flagella, but again, a unicellular alga. Now, shifting from the dinoflagellates to the one diatom that is an issue, and an issue here in uh, California, too, uh, it showed up first in Canada, and it was uh, the symptoms appeared to be amne amnesiac-like in the sense that this was older people were more affected and they had amnesia. Um, but it's, it turns out, they again, were looking for a, a dinoflagellate, but as it turns out, it was, it was found to be a diatom. And you can't read that very well in yellow, but it's, uh, it used to be a, a, a long, slender, single-cell uh, single diatom called Nitsia, which was reclassified to Pseudonitsia. So pseudonitsi is now the proper name. Uh, a couple of different um, species. I think the species that's off the coast here, pungens, is not the main one. There's a third species that's a more prevalent one here off the coast. But here's a single cell as an example. Quite long. Uh, a couple hundred microns long. So they're well, here, sorry, 20 microns, so 20, 40, maybe 60 microns long. Like all diatoms, they have this silica box around them. They're beautiful to watch and look at in the microscope. But that's how you have to identify at the species level is go and look and magnify and see the different holes or the choroids in there. So that's how they're identified, the species. All right, so those are the primary, uh, you know, marine hab toxins and the organisms that produce them. Um, again, that's not the topic here, but I wanted to introduce this lecture in the whole context of harmful algal blooms. Now, some of the websites that popped up here, there, and everywhere, the, the, because, well, both freshwater and marine habs are now an international issue but the marine ones probably more so there's more programs for them so they actually are part of the international o oceanographic commission out of unesco um, has programs and websites so they have these databases and directories and bibliographies and that's all on the ioc unesco have website 
uh, here in the U.S., we have the NOAA, of course, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, maintains a website. And they have in historically been the prime funders of all the research on marine HABs. So all the congressional funding that gets released for those programs comes through NOAA. So you have to convince NOAA. And there are, of course, federal NOAA labs. The main one I know of is in Seattle that does a lot of this work. I don't know where it is down here, but I'm sure there's one. Uh, they also have websites where they maintain program information, uh, community outreach, and overviews, and so on and so forth at that particular website up there. So NOAA has that. And then um, even more to the point, the Woods Hole manages the National HAB program for the United States. And the same person as Don Anderson, the same guy that coined the term Harville Idle Blooms. And their website, which is Red Tide website, has again general information, a photo gallery, species, human illnesses, distribution maps, and general information. None of these really contain much on cyanobacteria, although this website now does, and NOAA's starting to. NOAA's has never paid attention to freshwater because that's not their mandate. Uh, but they've started to because they now manage the new funding that goes to the e US EPA. So if you were to apply for a US EPA fund on freshwater, you would be dealing with monies that came through NOAA to the US EPA and then to you. Not that I think that works very well, but that's, <laughs> that's the way it's done. But anyway, NOAA, or um, HUI, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, has a good website. The, um, <clears throat> the other group that I haven't mentioned yet, um, and I'm, I don't know why it hasn't been identified in California, but in, uh, it really started out as an issue in Israel in the 1960s when they started doing a lot of aquacultured fish mm. and fish ponds. Oh, yes? Sorry for interruption, but you already recorded to me something in California, but it's an artificial lake. Oh, okay. It's just a sample, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we have to go. Okay. I, you, you must, because wherever there's brackish water. But it's not published, so. Not published and not... not, not it's not published and maybe because of the, it's not that well known, uh, it's recorded. But, and probably not tested for toxicity, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry? Oh, she said that there is a report of primnesium in California. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're it? Okay. Or one of them. One of the it's, is that right? Are there more than one then? I don't know. Where, where was this? Oh, okay. Right, okay. And these would be brackish water, and at least. Yeah, well, at least like Lake Michigan Bay, there would be a, uh, like a volcanic activity above 2000. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. And, uh, not to. We found it in November of last year, and we lost about 10,000 catchable fish. Okay, so probably toxic then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, all right. I, I, when I was up at UC Santa Cruz, nobody said, you know, I said, well, it has to be or should be, but nobody had dealt with it. So there's another one for your water board website, I guess. We're up, we're up to 20 states that have it since Texas in the right. uh, 80s, and we have got 4 in Southern California and uh, 7 in Oregon. Right. Yeah, when it first showed up in Texas, I got samples sent. So I actually cultured it. It's fun to grow, and I did all the hemolysis tests, but I didn't stay with it. So, but anyway, back to it. Primnesium is a completely different grouping of algae, not a dinoflagellate, but it's brackish water, and it originally thought that it was only producing a toxin that was a hemolytic toxin. In other words, hemolysis blood. 
and they were generically referred to as permesins. Now, I know that there's more current, in fact, I was just at a meeting where they had more structure determination. So there's actually two groups of toxins. One tends to be, the ones that's the, the ones that kill fish are really different than the so-called hemolysin toxins. Um, so there's ichthyotoxins and hemolysins. But the main problem, of course, is this mass more die-offs of fish, but it can also be clams and mussels, but mostly fish. It was first studied in Israel in the 1970s, and there they were able to solve the problem because they adjusted the pH in these ponds, and they're small ponds, so they could do that. Bigger systems would be harder to do. So it turns out not to be such an, uh, you know, an issue for fish ponds in Israel anymore. But then it started to occur in Texas. And when I got involved in Texas, it was mid-90s, I guess. And um, it was in the Brazo River um, near Waco. And the implication there was they had gone back in to try and force oil out of old wells. And to do that, they were pumping a salt brine into the wells, which then bubbled back up. and flowed into the river and created the brackish water and all the fish died. So that was the link back then. And now since then, they've looked at other places and it's become quite a common thing such that in the early 2000s they started workshops and there's a website and all kinds of things. But this would have been one of the mass fish mortalities that happened at Lake Granbury, which was kind of the, the poster lake in Texas for these studies. So this is all dead fish here. Right here. Well, brackish, um, whatever defines brackish and above, yes. Um, literally, when we grew it in the lab, I would create seawater and even elevated seawater. So the Salton Sea, I've always wondered why the Salton Sea never had it, for example. Uh, it just makes sense that that would be the proper brackish water conditions. Although the, the Salton can actually go hypersaline, so I don't maybe it's too much there. But I, as a number, I I not would. Do you have a number, low end number, and a high end number for salinity? To you? It seems to be, from what we're finding, it's uh, you know electrical conductivity two to three thousand. You might start. To yeah, those are micro siemens or yeah. yeah. But just because you're there doesn't mean that you have I mean, Right. Do you think that maybe brought in by birds? Right. So, um, again, at that website, they have general information and images and so on and so forth. Cyanobacteria. Let's finish off then before lunch with um, where are we going to go with this taxonomy on cyanobacteria. Here's our picture. Again, we want to be able to send you away having somewhat of a comfort level identifying these cyanobacteria. Straight chain filaments, coiled colonial filaments, unicellular colonies of various shapes this. Uh, filamentous colonies that look like this. Uh, what are we going to do? So the division cyanophyta, the blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria, or cyanoprokaryonta, as they're currently called. Um, sorry, this, this again is the reason why they were called the blue-green algae, remember when blue-greens lice, and you may have seen this if you get a lysine bloom, the accessory photosynthetic pigments leak out and they are blue-green in color. Sometimes they're red, but most often blue-green, hence the name blue-green algae. This is not what a healthy bloom looks like. This is what a decomposing, dying bloom looks like when the chlorophylls are masked by the release of this phycobilin pigments. And this would also represent, you know, a bloom, a phyto you know, phytoplankton or planktic bloom. But we can also have toxin producers that are benthic. 
And in this particular case, this is a benthic cyanobacteria called Lingvia. And um, this is in the Tennessee River. And I did a several year project there where this map forming, we call it map forming because when they come up, they're literally mats more than they look like scummy dispersible blooms. And you can literally pick them up. Normally they'd be down on the bottom, but as with massive growth, they get just too heavy and they produce the oxygen and they lift up. And in this case on the Tennessee River, they were displacing all of the macrophytes. So, you know, they just shove them out of the way and overshadow and they die. And then this was making the bass fishermen awfully, because if you, if you live in the Midwest, you better be a bass fisherman or at least talk like you are one because otherwise you don't belong. So anyway, so they had a fairly significant program. They actually brought in sterile grass carp to try and feed on them, but the grass carp didn't like them particularly well either. Um, so we went, we were asked to look at them. Is there any sort of compound, any toxin that might be at issue? Well, there was nothing to suggest that Lingbia produces these toxins. It's fresh water. But when we screened all of the different toxins, we found a potent neurotoxin. And it turns out that it was saxotoxins. And it turned out that it was a whole different chemical analog grouping of saxotoxins than we had identified from other blue-greens or from dinoflagellates. Um, and so that's what came out of it. The bottom line is that these benthic forms can produce toxins too in terms of cyanobacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria occupy extreme habitats. They've been around for at least two billion years. They can live anywhere. Here's an extreme habitat on rock, high altitude rocks not terribly clear on this, but this is a snowpack right there. And then all this dark reddish black looking streaks are a, uh, a colonial, small colonial one called Gliocapsa. And it's reddish because it produces accessory photosynthetic pigments that absorb UV. And in fact, the, you know, because at high altitude you have high UV, so this actually protects the cell but they would have chlorophylls and everything else just like another algae. And in fact, another trivia note, those accessory pigments that are UV absorbers are actually used commercially to create sunblock compounds, and that's a fairly viable industry. Kind of hard to scrape them off of the rocks at altitude, but you can grow them in the lab. In fact, Phanazomenon up here in Klamath Lake produces some of the best uh, sunblock compounds that are being commercially exploited presently. Maybe you use them, I don't know. Sunblock. Other extreme habitat just for fun. Uh, this is a blue-green algae growing in the hair of a polar bear at a zoo. In this case, you know, polar bears have these guard cells or these outer cells that are hollow. So the algae grows down inside those cells. Doesn't seem to affect the polar bear, but. Um, and then others are symbiotic. So this is a marine uh, symbiotic blue-green from Bonaire and the Lesser Antilles. I worked with a colleague at the University of Illinois who was a natural products chemist looking for anti-cancer compounds. And as you can tell, this is a, uh, it's like a piece of fruit leather. You peel it off, grows on reefs, and it's a tunicate, which is a little sea squirt. That's an animal. But entwined in that matrix that the sea squirt grows in is a blue-green algae, which is green, obviously, and it's one of the micro blue-greens called Sinecococcus. Same group that grows in the Salton Sea, but in a planktonic bloom-forming situation. In this case, it's symbiotic. And this thing was being harvested because it is a potent producer, well, the sea squirt is a potent producer of an anti-cancer compound used in whole tumor cancer treatments. And it's now in commercial and a pharmaceutical company in Spain produces it. But I was asked to look at it because knowing all these other compounds that cyanobacteria produce, 
whether it was the one actually producing the anti-cancer compound which would make it easier to take out and grow. And it turns out that the blue-green, in this case, produces a precursor that the tunicate uses to produce the anti-cancer compound. So it does um, contribute, but it's not the active producer of the anti-cancer compound. Anyway, again, showing you all these diverse habitats. Clearly the ones we're more concerned about from a freshwater risk are the planktonic and the benthic ones that are in lakes and reservoirs and rivers. But the blue-greens are spectacular for their ability to pretty much grow anywhere, as long as they get a source of light. Well, how do, therefore, we do the taxonomy of these organisms? Originally, it was the botanical approach because they were green and they were photosynthetic and they looked like algae. So the botanical approach was used in the botanical code, and it's been used since they started doing taxonomy on these. In fact, if you go to some of the big herbariums, I uh, worked for a while at the one in Paris, which has samples going back almost to the early 1800s, late 1700s even. The way to collect was to collect the algae, to dry it between papers like you would a plant, and stick it in a culture collection. So that's the botanical way. Well, in the 1970s, when we realized that cyanobacteria were prokaryotic and really bacteria, then the suggestion was that you needed to use the bacteriological approach and the bacteriological code, and that requires a culture and a whole different approach to classification based on Berge's manual of determinative bacteriology. So if you go to the newer volumes of Berge's, there's a whole division section on photosynthetic bacteria, and that's where the cyanobacteria classified. Well, both of these are really hard to use if you're like you and me and you want to know if a bloom is a problem because these systems require all kinds of things that we don't normally do. And the taxonomy has always been difficult because being prokaryotic, being bacteria, they have no sexual reproduction. All the other groups of algae have nice life cycles that produce sperm and egg or at least things that look like them or spores at least. So they fit into a life cycle that can define that as a species and you can look for differences. Nothing's like this. So all we are dealing with are those things I just showed you. Straight chain filaments, single filaments, colonies of filaments, colonies of unicells, and the shapes become important, and maybe whether they have an accessory pigment or not. So that's how it's been done. But there are real issues there. And while it's not important that you understand all that, uh, it does ha and has created a lot of taxonomy problems. But in general, cyanobacteria do have chlorophyll, produce oxygen, have those accessory pigments. These are the blue-green phycocyanin and the reddish phycoerythrin. They store food gly glycogen like other bacteria, so they don't store starch like plants do. And they have no sexual reproduction. They're prokaryotic, so they have 16S RNA. And that 16S RNA is what's going to turn out to be the new way to do taxonomy. Now taxonomy can be done with morphology and physiology and biochemistry, so obviously the new taxonomy is relying a lot more on genetics. Still morphological, but more on genetics. And that's where we're headed for the rest of the day. Some things about the morphological characteristics that are important for you to know if you're working with these is that the filament or the cell or the colony is called the thallus, which is a kind of a botanical throwback term. And around all of those cells and colonies and filaments is a sheath, slime layer, which is why if you're out looking at an algae bloom and it's green and you pick it up and it feels coarse and more like hair, then you're probably safe in saying this isn't a blue-green. But if it's slippery and slimy and sort of slides off your hand, then that's because it has this slime layer that makes it very slippery and slimy. And it, you know, could, even though it looks green, could very well be a cyanobacteria. So that's kind of your first clue. The branching, uh, they can be branched or unbranched, those filaments. 
not so important for taxonomy of toxic ones, but in general. And what is important are the specialized cells in some of them called heterocysts, which are the nitrogen fixing cells. I keep alluding to this nitrogen fixing or nine nitrogen fixer. Well, the nitrogen fixers have these specialized cells, heterocysts. And they also have resting cells or spores called aconites. So those are important for taxonomy. So in, in reality, the morphological characteristics that are important for taxonomy of toxic cyanobacteria would be unicell, colonial unicells, single filaments, colonial filaments, presence and absence of heterocysts, presence and absence of spores. So it kind of gets condensed down into some key things which we're going to focus on. Physiologically, taxonomies, you know, but that's really not so important for our purposes. The pigments, those chlorophylls and the phycobilins are important. Um, and again, I'll just drop straight down to here because the 16S RNA is, becomes the key thing in the new taxonomy where we do uh, PCR and genetic typing. So the, the older genetic methods, which aren't used, were things like DNA, DNA hybridization, DNA base composition. Still has some use, but it's not a very useful thing. There's just too much variability to be able to identify species. But 16S RNA is universal and highly conserved, making it useful for taxonomy. It's a good chronometer of evolutionary change as well. So that's the key to take home. When I give you these new keys, and they are referred to as polyphasic keys, that's because poly means more than one. They're using classic morphology and genetics, and most of the genetics is going to be the 16S RNA. Well, how do they do that? Well, I think everyone who's had a basic biochemistry class now, which was after I took biochemistry, but poly polymerase chain reactions or PCR, it's the new guru. Everybody hears of it. If you don't, haven't ever used it, you at least heard of it. So PCR is used as the key thing in the 16S, going after the 16S, and getting you all that information that goes into the taxonomy. So using that, this is an old tree then. You do all of the 16S sequencing. And now, of course, sequencers are cheap and everybody can do them. Uh, you end up performing these phylogenetic trees. And this is the kind of information now that pushes all the new taxonomy. In this particular one, these are a phanosomenon, APH, and Nostoc, and Nodularia, and Anabenas, and Cylindrospermopsis. Um, so a lot of the ones that turn out to be important for taxonomy of, of toxic cyanobacteria. And you say, well, why would that make a difference? Well, I can tell you it makes a difference. Uh, when you're trying to identify something and, and say that it's toxic and non-toxic, and if that organism happens to be Phanosoma on Flosaka, which is a multi-million dollar industry, and people say it's toxic, and then genetically you can say uh, it's not because it's this species by genetics, then you have a legal base. So it, when it comes down to it, it not only gets you into the right groups, it provides a legal basis for putting you into those right groups. There are some other PCR tools using other genes, for example, the nitrogen fixing gene and the gene that's for the phycobilosomes, which are the structures that produce the phycoerythrin and phycocyanin is used. And these are, again, used secondarily for taxonomy, but it's, it's, it's really the uh, 16S that's the most important. And of course, now recently, we're studying toxin genes. So we have sequences now for the toxin genes for microcystins, cylindrospermopsins, saxitoxins, and anatoxins. 
and I keep waiting for kits to come out, gene-based kits, which are just not there yet. There is a kit in Australia that's developed that's sold there, but it's not sold internationally. So we are fall back then on kits that are detecting, um, you know, like microcystin with ELISA, immunoassays, which are older kits and work, but gene-based kits could be a little more specific, but we don't have them yet. But that's what PCR is used for. So just remember PCR, PCR of 16S is the primary thing. So some identification references that where I get all my information from. Um, the main ones we're going to worry about today, and I didn't bring them because they're too big, but the new taxonomy has been developing now since 1998 when the first volume was out. And these are all referred to as volume one, two, and three of the cyanoprokaryonta. And then this first one is the Crococcales, and those are the unicellular, unicellular colonial uh, forms. The second one, the oscillatory ailes, these are filamentous ones that don't have specialized cells, heterocysts. And the third volume is the heterocystis genera which contain most of the toxin producers, although number one does too. So what I'm going to condense and summarize for you after lunch and then you look at is what's in this. And as you can see, this third volume itself is 1,100 pages. So the three volumes that stand about this high and are over 2,000 pages. Um, don't go anywhere near them. So. <laughs> Uh, we did a little taxonomy in 2001 for WHO, but again, we're not going to use that today. But the dichotomous key that's out there that's in this book, and I've replicated it for you in the handout, is the one we're going to use. Dichotomous key, you know what that is? Okay. Yes, no, two choices. So you look at a characteristic and you say yes or no. If it's yes, then you go and maybe that's it. If you go no, then you go down to the next one. So this is a short dichotomous key that focuses and brings it down to just those that are toxic, most of them. And uh, prior to that, there was one that was a taxonomy dichotomous key for the microcystis species in China. We'll throw that up, but we're not going to worry too much about it. But, don't do this. <laughs> okay. It logged off. Um, boy, that was good timing. Anyway, let me just finish. Um, the key that we're going to, the economist key we'll use is in here. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, all the rest of this, I'm going to repeat again after lunch. Make sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat all of this after lunch because I was going to do it twice. So you get 